Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Andrew Silito is a business psychologist, performance coach, public speaker, and author from London, England. Andrew is a professional roller hockey player and coach who overcame gout and is now feeling physically and mentally stronger at 44 than he did at 24, thanks to the carnivore diet. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Hey, Scott. Great to be here. Such a pleasure. Yeah. um, And we've chatted before in the past a lot about your story, um, but I think it would be really interesting to hear from you. a little bit about your health history. You know, how did you eat growing up? Um, what led, what do you think led to, you know, you developing gout? Um, let, let's hear it. Okay. I think it goes back probably to my childhood of growing up in a bakery. Uh, I was, uh, I come from a family, generations of bakers, always going to be a baker. Uh, there was no doubt in my mind I would take over the business. Unfortunately, my dad had uh, other plans, you know, the bakery business, the kind of cottage industry was being overtaken by the, the big supermarkets. Although I think, you know, with the, the kind of farmer's markets and so on, he probably could have done really well uh, and adapted. But anyway, he didn't. And he went into property. And uh, I think that's probably where I, I developed my sweet tooth growing up. But the, without digressing too much, my, my father made a lot of money in property. And uh, in the nineties, there was a big crash and my father never really recovered from that. And he enjoyed the good life. In fact, he, he suffered with gout and they, they, my family joke about it because unfortunately my father, with the stress and anxiety and, and everything else caught up with him in the end. And he, he died of a sudden heart attack age 48. So he was, he was really young. I was 16 at the time. And my family kind of joke about it, that the only thing my dad left me was gout because I started suffering with gout probably in my late twenties. Well, I was diagnosed with it in 2006, but it goes right back uh, to, I, I can remember times being in pain and just joking with people and saying, I think I've got gout. And, and then, but I was like 22, 23, it's just impossible. But, but I think there were some lifestyle things which, which I'll come on to. But I did say, you know, when my father died, I, I went all in on uh, playing hockey. It was my, my passion. I, I played, grew up playing street hockey, which is an unusual sport for a Brit to play. I live in the southeast of England. There were no ice rinks and street hockey and skating was just really popular in the 80s. And I just caught a wave. The sport uh, developed in the 90s with inline skates, you know, rollerblades, and I think the whole Mighty Ducks movement. And, um, and then, this, yeah, the sport just took off. And I, I ended up moving to Canada to play a uh, little bit out of my comfort zone, but I, I was just so passionate about it and really got into my training. And uh, really pursued it aggressively, and uh, eventually I ended up playing professionally in the in the North American Roll Hockey Championships. I was the first British player to do that. So that was back in two thousand and four. I played in eleven World Championships for Great Britain, and and then became head coach. Um, but the what I noticed back in around two thousand and six, I was getting some real pain in my hip, uh, and I, I went to the doctor. It was actually it started from my groin, and I was saying to the doctor, look, I've got, I just can't get rid of this groin injury. And he said to me, I, I think it's your hip. I think you've got a, a hip injury. And then I had some x-rays and they diagnosed me with um, degenerative arthritis in my hip. And I just thought, oh, well, that's just life being a sports person and just have to deal with it, right? It's just one of those things that um, we have to accept. So I ended up, I played it for a couple more years, but in 2008, I was just in so much pain. In the end, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't play anymore. And I was also, uh, by then, been diagnosed with gout, and it was becoming a problem. It was starting to really interfere because anyone that gets gout, you know, you might get a bit of pain in the toe, and it goes after three days. You maybe change your diet, and you kind of, kind of live with it. Or some people take medication, 
but after a while it was becoming chronic. I was getting it in my wrists, so I, my my elbows, my knees. It was starting to move around my body. And it wasn't just lasting for three days. It was lasting for 10 days. And then the worst one I had back in 2000 and uh, about 2010, 2012, I had it really bad. And uh, it just, just wouldn't go. So I started talking to uh, you know, surgeons and, and doctors and, and just trying to get as much help as I could. And like all doctors, they would just say the same thing. You know, you just got to manage your diet. You've got to eat foods that are, are low in purines. And that's what it says on the internet. So I followed that and I, I tried everything. Like I, I went vegan for a period of time. I, I went, uh, you know, I just tried to, you know, vegetarian, just tried to eliminate meat from my diet to see if that would work and just have a more of a, a starchy diet. But interestingly, when I took on the, the head coaching job, for Team GB, some of the players, I'd been out of the game for two years then. So this is around towards the end of 2010, 2011. And a lot of guys had got into CrossFit. And I hadn't really heard of CrossFit at this point. I, it was the kind of style of training I enjoyed. And so I kind of got into that, that scene a little bit. And obviously, people started talking about paleo. And when I heard about it, it just made absolute sense to me, this idea of getting aligned with an ancestral diet. I've always been really curious about diet. I think growing up in a bakery, I got a, a little bit chubby. I mean, when I look at pictures, actually, of myself, I, I don't see any chubby pit, <laughs> pictures of me being chubby. But in those days, if you're a little bit overweight, it was unusual. And uh, unlike today, unfortunately. And, you know, friends used to you know make fun of me a little bit. And, you know, the worst day of the, of the week was when we had to play skins. You know, when you're playing football, what we call soccer. And, you, you know, in those days, you, you had shirts against skins. I don't know if you had that in America, but it was just the worst because I always seemed to be on the skins team and I was really embarrassed of my body. Yeah. Um, but so I've always been curious about health. And, and I think I, I kind of dabbled with the Atkins diet in my early 20s and, and things like that. So when I heard about paleo, it, it just made sense. But it didn't really cure my gout. Uh, I was what I did notice was that my hip got better, and and as a result of that, I started doing some more gym work, and I wasn't experiencing the same inflammatory arthritis in my body as I was with what you would call a, a standard American diet, which is what people would call in England a, a normal diet: waking up, eating cereal, sandwich for lunch with a soda probably, and then whatever is available to eat in the evening. Um, so. So by eliminating grains, and I probably eliminate dairy for a bit, I just noticed that I would walk into town and normally I would, I would just be in pain. Like I would just, it would take, the, take my breath away, this, this pain. But as I said, that it never really cured the gout. In fact, I even tried vegan after that. I mean, I just went through this series of things up until about 2017. And were you, sorry, Andrew, um, just one quick question. Yep. Were you managing the protein along the way or the prolongs um, it, no it wasn't on my like the common no, I, I wasn't measuring anything for gout. it was just you know meat and sweet potatoes you know it just it was just a bit random really um but i i i cut out most starches and, and grains at this point um but it was still in, coming into my diet you know and i was still drinking alcohol beers after you know the game and and things like that so the gout was getting worse and 2017, a, a personal trainer I, I spoke to in my local gym, I just said to him, look, I really need to get on top of this. I, I really want to improve my training, but you know, I, I'm not going to be able to if I keep getting these attacks. And he just said to me, he did, he did a little bit of research on it, on the gout. And he said, you know, you've tried everything. You've done what the doctors have said. Would you consider the ketogenic diet? And... I kind of got my interest again because of my curiosity. I, I, I like trying and experimenting with things. And what was amazing about this is that I, I did it. I, I mean, he, he did give me a bit of a, a, a meal plan. But two things happened. Uh, well, there were a couple of things, probably three things actually. The first thing is I got a gout attack by going keto, but he warned me that that might happen. But it wasn't severe, it was just painful. It wasn't like I was laid up on, a, on the couch for two weeks. It was just difficult to walk, difficult to get my skate on. And I was starting to play hockey by this point. Again, I'd, I'd come back into the game. And we, we were traveling to Latvia to play in a competition. And I took everything with me. I got all my food. I thought, I'm not going to let this tournament get in the way. 
I'm going to take everything with me. I'm going to go to the supermarket, buy everything when I'm there and carry on with it. So one, I, I did get a bit of a, a small gout attack. Secondly, the thing I noticed mostly was my cognitive ability. I can remember like it was yesterday. Like I'd never experienced anything like it. That my clarity on the ring, I just felt so much, so composed. I, when I came back into the game, I felt like I had a lot to prove. And I, I really suffered with anxiety about the games I was playing in. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of expectations on me. And it just, I just felt so relaxed. Like the anxiety just disappeared um, from, and I could only put it down to the keto. And that just carried on. And, and then in around 2000, uh, late 2018, I think I'd seen Sean Baker's talk with, with on the Rogan show, started listening to other things. I'd, I'd been following Mark Sisson for a while. I actually became a primal health coach because of my enthusiasm for it. And I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll do the carnivore diet. And I did it consistently for about 60 days. And I remember thinking I've got a, I had a game and I'd never played zero carbs. This is 2000 and early 2019. And I'd, I'd never really played competitively, completely zero carb. I mean, nothing, you know, not even a couple of dates, nothing, just steak and eggs for, for, in fact, it was just steak for 30 days. And I remember being nervous. And I remember even on the way to the game thinking, Maybe I should just get something on the way just in case, you know, that I just fade or whatever. And I just didn't. I mean, I, I had eaten a lot of protein on the Saturday just before the, the game on the Sunday. So I expect through gluconeogenesis, I I probably had so much protein that maybe I was getting some, some energy for it. But I felt amazing. Like I just, I just had so much energy. But it wasn't the fact that I was even needing to... It was the way I exerted my energy as well. Like I was so... So much, I just felt so composed on the puck. And uh, so I've never really looked back since then. I mean, I've flipped between um, keto and, and carnivore. And, I, and for me, Scott, and I think you hear this a lot, you know, I, I did get a bit concerned about when I was going into some of the groups that some of the carnivores were like, if I said to somebody, I, I'd eaten an apple, it's like they were horrified at me, you know, because yeah. I was <laughs> And I started to kind of withdraw from the carnivore community a little bit because of that. Cause I thought, you know, I'm, I'm using this as a, as a really powerful tool. Like it's, it's such a great way to reset the body, reset my gut. Um, and even my wife now, she's fully support. When I first started doing it, we'd go to a restaurant and I'd say to the, the, the waitress, can I just, can I have a double helping of meat, but not the potatoes, not the veg, not this, not that. My wife would just roll her eyes and be really embarrassed. Um, but now she's really supportive because she sees the difference in me. I mean, our marriage nearly broke down. I mean, we actually separated in the end because in 2017, because it was, I think with the gout and the stress and everything else that was going on, you know, anyone that gets gout, they'll know it's, it's incredibly stressful. Like it's brutal. It's the most painful thing. Um, so, so from that experience, you know, I really started to try to understand what was going on you know, and, and speak to my doctor and say, look, I'm doing this. And my doctor was very supportive. In fact, he, his son played hockey. So he, he knew me and he said, you've got to do what works for you, you know, and, and maybe it isn't just about the purines because gout, you know, the first thing they say is don't eat foods with high, high purines. And obviously that's meat and organ meat and so on. And, but then when you look into it, most food has purines in it. I mean, our body is, you know, two thirds of the purines we have are already in our body. They're, you know, endogenous, you know, it's, it, a third of it's exogenous. So um, for me, it's more about how we metabolize the purines and the precursors around that. So for me, you know, eating grains probably interferes with that. Uh, eating sugar, you know, I think interferes with our ability to metabolize purines. And obviously those purines that don't get metabolized then, you know, create a, like a byproduct in the, in the body called uric acid. And that uric acid for, forms these crystals, which is what creates the pain. And, and since, since that moment, I've not had any, I've not had a gout attack apart from one, which I shared with you. I think I, I mentioned it to you last time we spoke, which was quite recent. And I was so disappointed with myself and I'm happy to share that. Yeah. I think it'd be interesting, but because I think it also illustrates the point that we're not invincible as human beings. And even though we try and move away from pain every now and then our old behaviors catch up with us. And uh, that was, it was quite shocking to me, actually. Uh, but, but there's a story in there around how I, got, how I got rid of the gout again. 
um, which I'm happy to share with you. I, I've, yeah. I've been rambling on for a while, so you might have a question for me. A lot of people ask me about how to make liver more tasteful and how to cook it or incorporate other organ meats on carnivore. Optimal Carnivore can help you do just that with their grass-fed organ complex. It was created by carnivores for carnivores. They start by sourcing 100% grass-fed organ meats from New Zealand, gently freeze-drying the organs and encapsulating them into convenient bovine gelatin capsules. Just six of these capsules a day is the same as eating an ounce of raw organ meat. I personally take these every single day, as does my wife. Even though we both eat liver and other organ meats, our ancestors would have eaten the whole animal. And this unique blend has nine different organs, including beef liver, brain, thymus, kidney, spleen, etc. And I think it's great to get a daily dose of these organs when you can. So it covers all your bases, whether you're at home or traveling. What's also cool is they plant a tree for every product sold, which helps the environment. So visit www.optimalcarnivore.com slash carnivorecast and use the code carnivore10 to receive 10% off your purchase. Thanks and back to the show. Super interesting. Thank you for sharing, Andrew. Your story is fascinating and, and um, I really appreciate you, you sharing intimately the details of your struggles and everything you tried. Um, and, and gout just seems like such a crippling condition. Um, I can't imagine and it's one of those where, um, and I've had some health scares like this, where it seems like there's no real remedy, and there's you know some diet, some vague dietary intervention that doesn't really work for most people, right. and you can you try to track down the evidence behind it, and you can't really find it, um, and then you're you're trying this way of eating that makes you feel so great, but it goes directly against that evidence, and you're like man, should I be doing this? And you, you're always questioning yourself. So before getting into that story, I'd, I'd love to talk about a, a little bit about mindset too. Um, you know, your relationship with food and the psychology of, of changing your diet and how how maybe that's that's evolved over time. Yeah, sure. I, I, I think there's definitely, well, I know for sure that I was an emotional eater. You know, I, I attached happiness with with food and you know in in the u k you know one of my my favorite indulgences were were like dark chocolate digestives and i and I don't know if you have them over there McVitie's here in the u k well I'm in Prague now, but in the u k McVitie's dark chocolate biscuits were my nemesis, like I could just devour a whole packet of those and and it did occur to me that i i kind of i was a self confessed biscoholic you know cookies um but there was, but I realized there was something going on there, some kind of emotional attachment to food. And I don't know if that was due to trauma, you know, losing my father, but even before that, growing up in a bakery, just having this, I mean, every day cakes and, you know, it's just happiness, right? I mean, but, but realizing that there was definitely a correlation between this kind of binge eating high sugar diet and inflammation in my body. And as I started to you know, grow, you got into my thirties, I started to really see this connection. But the, the, the other problem was that growing up playing sports, particularly in the, in my twenties, when we, when I was playing competitively for Great Britain, we, we had sponsors with food products and we were, you know, every period putting these gels in our body, we're eating these cereal bars, uh, electrolytes drinks, which are like hundred grams of carbohydrate in one of them. And then we'd have a, uh, the power drink at, you know, after that, before the game, after the post game, and we were probably consuming around a thousand grams of carbohydrate uh, with all these different concoctions, believing that it was given us a competitive advantage. But I think it was leading to severe inflammation in the body. In fact, I, I'm, I'm almost certain it was. And if I'd known then what I know now about uh, food and the impact on the body, uh, gosh, I I wonder what what my career could have been like, or even just my twenties could have been like from a from just living life happy. I mean, the one thing that, and I hear it all the time on your podcast is, is that I never considered myself depressed. Like I didn't think of myself as a depressed person. In fact, my nickname growing up was Smiley. And I, I, on my first CV, I put that I had a happy disposition and, and I'm certain that's why I got my first job when I was younger. Um, so I never considered myself to be depressed. 
But every now and then people would say to me, are you okay? Is everything all right? You know, you just seem a bit off, you know, why can't you relax? Why can't you just enjoy, you know, being out with us? And I remember a girlfriend, an ex-girlfriend of mine's mother said to me, you look like you're depressed, you know, what's going on? And I just, just, just didn't think about it. But then I think about losing my father at 16 and the trauma and everything else that came with it. But it wasn't until the ketogenic diet definitely gave me clarity and made me feel, felt composed. But the carnivore diet, and I heard someone else say this, it gives me goosebumps when I think about it, like giggly, like so happy. And it's like, oh, okay, so maybe this is how human beings are supposed to feel. This is what, this is what helped our survival over the last 150, 200,000 years or whatever it was. This, the fact that we were so positive and happy. I mean, we wouldn't, probably wouldn't have survived what we did during those times without it. So I think there is something very natural and how we're supposed to feel. And I think the carnivore diet influences that, whether it's ketones, you know, making that difference. I don't know. I don't measure ketones. Um, I'm almost certain I'm probably in ketosis most of the time. Uh, and I can share with you how I eat and, and what I do now. But uh, it's just interesting. It's an interesting question about mindset, you know, and I you hear so many people talk about depression and they, they're speaking to a therapist and they're taking antidepressants and they're doing everything they can. And then they look after their, and it's probably the gut as well, right? You know, we know that the relationship between the gut, you know, the vagus nerve goes from the brainstem right into the gut. There's definitely a relationship between the gut and the brain and how we feel and the chemical hormones in the body, you know, elevated serotonin levels, reduced cortisol, all these things that make a difference. And I, and I just believe 100% that the carnivore diet is the best way to reset that and get us back into a place of a state where we, we are optimal. Not in a performance way, but cognitively. Yeah, um, I I fully agree with that. I think it it really provides a lot of stability. And both of the ways you're talking about the carnivore diet, I I can completely relate to seeing it as a reset, both mentally and physically. Um, I think that's a great way to describe it for people. And so, can you talk about um, your story? The story you mentioned, the most recent incident. Um, with gout, you know, what caused it? Um, what did you learn from it? What did you do? Yeah. So I learned a lot about myself and how vulnerable I am. But to give it a, a kind of a, a long story short, we moved apartments and it was really a stressful time because it, it was costing us a lot more money than, than we expected. And after a really tough year with COVID and, and I was thinking, oh, and it was really playing on my mind. And I mean, anyway, we, I think that was part of it. And the stress was building up. I could feel it coming on. But there's something about, you know, mindset and the psychology, which I'll come on to in a moment as a business psychologist. I, I kind of share that with you and how I experienced it myself. But it just started off. We, we moved into place. It was a Friday afternoon. And my wife said, hey, we haven't got any food. I'll go and get some food. And I said, well, why don't you go and get a, a, a bur- get takeaway food? And she came back with a burger and fries. And I thought to myself, you know, what? I've been really good. You know. Um, this is not going to hurt. It's just, you know, some, something in my brain just said, this is okay. Just enjoy it. Don't make a big deal about it. And it probably wouldn't have made a difference. But I don't really drink a lot, right? I don't drink at all now. I haven't had a drink for, for a long time, well, pretty much since this, this, this incident. Because I do believe alcohol makes a difference to how we metabolize our food and affects how we metabolize purines and, and can lead to gout. So anyway, I had this burger and fries which are probably cooked in awful seed oils and, you know, the burgers probably fried in seed oil. And then some friends came over in the evening and we were kind of really enjoying the moment, you know, celebrating our new apartment, which is really nice. It's in Prague. It looks over Letna Park. It's just a lovely apartment. And he said, well, I'll get some beers. And I thought, you know what, I'm, you know, cause I'm really precise about it. That even when I was drinking, I would kind of say, right, well, I can, I know I can have two. So I did that. Next day, we're building IKEA furniture. I don't know if you've built IKEA furniture, but it's like we had an IKEA building marathon of all the, you know, wardrobes and drawers yeah. and everything. And uh, so my brother-in-law came over, and he brought goulash and beer. And I remember looking at this goulash, thinking there's something something in this. When I, and it's funny when you have gout, you kind of look at food and you you fear it, right? But I looked at it; it was meat, but of course it had flour in it had a beer with it, somehow justified that in my mind. And up to this point, absolutely fine. But then I had a, two days really late, working late. And I was wo- walking home and I, I popped into this kind of convenience store 
And I bought myself one of these date bars, you know, like a paleo date bar, you know. So really high in sugar. And I woke up at three o'clock in the morning in pain. I was like, here we go. I've got gout. And it was all the kind of steps, you know, from the Friday of having the burger and fries, the goulash on the on the Saturday was full of flour and probably some other sauce and and the beer with it. And then the stress and then this bar. And that was the trigger. So people in with gout, they will always talk about the trigger. They don't always talk about the things that they ate on the way. They talk about the trigger. And they they associate the gout with that one thing, which could have been like this this date bar. I woke up in the morning and I thought, right, I know what to do. I'm going to start drinking celery juice. I stop eating meat, right? So because I was scared of eating meat, you know, I'm, I'm back on the internet and I'm looking for things. So Hyperion's right. Yeah, don't eat any meat. Just eliminate meat. Just stick to water, celery juice. Um, my wife was making this quinoa thing. I thought that would be safe. So I did this quinoa. I didn't have any like bread or anything like that because I know I still believe bread is a, is a problem. But I could not shake this gout attack. It lasted for five weeks, Scott. Like it was just brutal um, all over Christmas. I'm sorry. It was just, it was awful. Like I just, and my wife was getting to that point where her patients had kind of run out and a little bit angry that I, because she would look at it as being that like I'd done it to myself, right? But I was trying everything to get rid of it. And coincidentally, on it was New Year's Eve, um, and I, I was up in pain until it was about three o'clock in the morning. I ended up putting a podcast on one of, one of yours. Started listening to your podcast, and I can't remember the guy's name, but he had a product. It was around end of December, so I don't know if you can recall who it was, but it was a good, really good podcast. I was listening to that, and I just thought to myself, you know what? I was carnivore and didn't get gout. I'm scared of eating meat because everyone, you know, it's, I've been brainwashed to believe that it's got to be the meat. Uh, if I eat meat, it will make it worse. I've tried everything. And so the next day, January 1st, I decided, I'm, I said to my wife, I'm, all I'm going to eat is meat today. I'm just going to eat steak. That's it. Let's see what happens. Will it get worse? So I went out, I bought steak, and I bought just as much as I could as, so I wouldn't get hungry. Probably had ate about, I don't know, a pound and a half of, of steak. And the next day, I could walk. Like I was walking, it was still painful. So I thought I'm not out of the woods yet, but I'll just do the same thing again. Then I was walking quite comfortably. Like my my father-in-law and mother-in-law came over and they were like, what? New Year's, New Year's Eve, you couldn't even, you were just laying on the couch. Now you're walking around. What's happened to you? You've been like this for five weeks and now you're walking around. I said, I've eaten nothing but meat for two days. It seems to be working. By day four, I was doing push-ups, squats and pull-ups in the outdoor gym. And my, you know, it was like how, and this is the thing with mindset. And it's interesting for anybody out there that is, you know, listening to your podcast, Scott, and, and really wants to make change in a life. And what amazes me is how easy it is to get amnesia. And so what, what I mean by that is, and hangover is a really good example. When we have the hangover from hell, the last thing we're ever going to do in our lives is drink alcohol until two weeks later and our friends ask us out and we're back doing the same thing. We repeat the same pattern. So even though we're discontent with our eating habits, discontent with our health, discontent with life, discontent with things in our life, and we announce to the world, right, I'm going to change. What often happens is that the, the pain of change is greater than the pain we're in. But we forget. We forget the pain because we have this kind of amnesia. And it just amazed me how vulnerable I was that I could fall back into an old habit of that kind of blase. Yeah, the burger and the fries would be fine. A few beers here and there. I'll eat that goulash fine. In fact, I think I had a cake as well and it'd be fine. And, um, and unfortunately, fortunately, it has been, a, it was a long time since I had a gout attack. So it wasn't like before I was having them every month, every two months. So it'd been years. And I, I can't imagine right now, you know, ever doing that again. Like, you know, I'm sure they'll get further and further apart. I don't drink. I consider myself a non-drinker, even though, I'd, and I wasn't drinking much. But now, because I was only drinking like a beer here and there, it's like, well, why bother drinking? Uh, it, it makes no sense if it's really going to have that effect on my body. Uh, I, I, I'm loving life. I love the energy. I, in, in some ways, the, having a gout attack, and I think anybody that's experienced pain of some sort, also experienced transformation. 
And I'm in the business of transformation, not not physical transformation, but mental transformation. And transformation, I think even people that want to change their their body shape, improve improve how they how they look and what they see in the mirror starts on the inside. You know, it starts with that shift and go back to your point about mindset and changing our relationship with food and and starting to realize that there's so much more to life on the other side of that than crushing a Domino's because of that short-term value or the Pringles and then whatever it is, which it is no good for our body. And the simplicity and the freedom of making that shift. I mean, it really is a hero's journey for anybody, you know, using the kind of Joseph Campbell analogy of the hero's journey. Anybody that ventures into carnivore, keto, or is really making real change in their life uh, is, is crossing that threshold. And they're probably a little bit scared. They're probably hearing what the doctors say and about red meat and all these different things. And on the hero's journey, there are allies and, and enemies and the enemies will try and pull us back into the old ways. And, and that could even be the doctor, right? Um, they don't see themselves as an enemy. Um, the, the system doesn't see itself as an enemy. They probably believe they can help in some ways. So we have to seek out the, the allies. And, and for me, that's, that's been you, Scott. It's been the, the podcast, your guests. It's been Mark Sisson, Brad Kearns, you know, people in my, Rob Wolf, all these people that unknowingly have been my allies in my journey and helped me live a life which is so amazing now. And, and my gout is in remission. It will never go because I'm, I'm still vulnerable to it, but it, it is in remission. And can't imagine it happening ever again because not because I'm can't eat a carnival diet or ketogenic diet, but because life is so much better now with this lifestyle. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, I'm I'm so glad to hear it. And it's it's really inspiring, Andrew. Um, and I'm happy to have been a small part of it. Uh your point You're around part of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Your point around memory loss, I think I mentioned this when we spoke previously, is so powerful to me. Uh, it doesn't just apply to diet, like your your example with the hangover and I'm never gonna drink again. It's so it's so true. I mean, I, I haven't had alcohol in years, but I, I do the same thing in so many aspects of my life, professionally, um, you know, uh, with friends, with my wife, um, with just so many things. It's it's like you feel this song, strong sense of regret and then it fades over time and you make the same mistakes again and again. Right. Uh, yeah. But that's part of being human. And I think if, if we um, dwell too long on our failures, uh, that can be, that can take a giant emotional toll as well. So uh, yeah, it's a balance. Agreed. Yeah, it is about balance, you know, and uh, I think that's what got me into this initially. You know, like I think Mark Sisson has a good perspective on that. You know, he talks about the 80 20. I always have to aim for 100 because if I aim for 80 20, then I'm probably going to be about 50 50. So yeah, um, yeah, I, th- I think the, the amnesia thing, I'm sure a lot of people can, can relate to it because it's, it's just being human. Um, but I think, you know, when, when people, you know, another good example is, is waking up early in the morning, right? The idea of waking up early for some people seems just why bother? Uh, but after a while, you know, you start to really appreciate getting up early and being out in the fresh air. Mm, And so all of a sudden to being up until 2am watching Netflix seems silly. And why would I do that? Because that would take away from my early rise and being out and really attacking the day. Uh, but again, it's that it's that shift, uh, and I'm and I think there are steps. It's like you know we're habit stacking a little bit here. It's like the first thing is well, let's have a good morning routine. Let's just try, you know, waking up and having a glass of water. Let's just well, let's just start by waking up early and, and then having a glass of water. And I do five things every morning. And anyone that's got gout or you know feeling stress, uh, feeling burnt out, you know, for me the morning routine is is key, and managing the you know the sympathetic nervous system engaging the parasympathetic nervous system and learning how to shift from that sympathetic nervous system to parasympathetic quickly is key and i think carnival diet and ketogenic diet i think that's one of the things that helps us do anyway we're definitely more composed but i i what i like to do is in the morning have have my water and i do a kind of a, a routine exercising moving my body a bit of strength work 
depending on how I'm feeling. Usually it's like 100 squats, 25 push-ups, sorry, 50 push-ups, 25 pull-ups type thing and or my yoga exercise. But I like to do a bit of 10, 10 minutes meditation, guided meditation, and then go straight into a cold shower. And people ask me why I do that. And for me, it's the ability to shift quickly, to learn how to shift from stress to calm. So when you get in the cold shower, you get stressed really quickly. It's not about just grooming and bearing it. It's just about being able to compose myself, you know, the kind of Wim Hof type stuff. Uh, because then when these things happen during the day, you know, you get uh, blindsided. Like my, my picture on Instagram is me getting punched in the face because I talk about burnout, uh, you know, coming from nowhere. It's insidious and uh, it's the punch in the face we don't see coming. So when we, when we learn to adapt to stimuli, to threats, to dangers, and again, I, I really do believe the carnivore diet helps us do that. Um, but the more we practice it early on in the day, the easier it is throughout the day. So that, that's just, I think, morning routines for anybody that's feeling stressed, overwhelmed, suffering with gout, inf- inflammation, that composure in the morning and having time to ourselves is, is you know, getting your own oxygen mask on first is the, is the cliche, I guess. Yeah, that's really powerful. Um, and I, I was listening to a podcast recently where someone said, um, ironically, because I always, I always meditate in the morning and have a similar morning routine like you, they said, why would you meditate in the morning? If you need to meditate first thing upon waking when nothing has happened to you, there's something wrong with you. Um, you know, it's normal to meditate. Maybe you need to meditate at lunch or at the end of the day to calm yourself down. I thought about that. And I, um, it really made like took me back for a second. And questioned like, should I be? Is there a reason I'm doing this at the start of my day? But um, it really does set up my headspace to be a little bit less reactive each day. So I, I think it is, it is really powerful. I, I believe so. And why not do it later in the day if if, if you want to? But for me, it's yeah. about being proactive. It's it's about being mindful. It's about developing the ability to notice what's going yeah. on what sort of threats and stresses there are and then being able to compose ourselves. And I think if you, for me, that, that guided meditation in the morning or some box breathing, whatever works is the foundation for the day. It's a platform to, to build on the whole day on. Yeah. I, I think another piece of this comes from a common misconception about meditation. I think actually the person I was listening to doesn't meditate. So maybe as part of it, uh, a lot of people right. think meditation is supposed to calm you down, but really it's supposed to raise your level of awareness. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So, yeah. so I guess yeah. that can help explain also the misperception. Yeah. Um, and Andrew, talk us through what like a day of eating looks like for you. Um, what do you eat on an average day? What do you include? Um, anything you avoid or make sure you get in on a daily or weekly basis? Yeah, so it it shifts a little bit. I don't have uh, anything that's too uh, rigid, but typically, you know, it depends if I get out the house early. So when I get out the house early, I will I'll just have coffee and and I probably won't eat until uh, midday. Uh, so I'll I'll typically have three eggs around. I'm still conscious of not eating too much meat. And so six, six to eight ounces of meat with three eggs, salad, um, if I'm going keto. And, and then later in the evening, I'll probably have two pork chops. I live in Prague. We've, we've got a bit of a challenge here with intensive farming. So if you buy, buy it from the supermarket, it's not very good quality. So if, if I buy it, uh, we have a great company here called um, the Meat Society in the Czech Republic. So it's all bio. Uh, but uh, a T-bone or a, a ribeye is going to be around probably forty-five dollars in US US money. So um, that's not sustainable every day, right? I do pick up these fillets steaks occasionally, uh, but they're very lean. Uh, as I like I like fatty cuts of meat. I really enjoy. It. So I, I I buy quite a bit of pork, uh, pork chops. I do buy burgers, but I do find with the burgers for whatever reason, particularly if I overeat, but it's like like if I have one, like a a three ounce burger or something like that. I'm fine too. It's okay. But as soon as I start indulging, I think I'm really hungry. I haven't eaten all day. I'm gonna have four burgers because they're, they're there. I do notice inflammation in my body. I don't know what it is about mincemeat. I don't know if you've got an answer to that, but, uh, and it's bio as well. It's not like it's, um, you know, these are good quality burgers, but for some reason I just get a, a bit of inflammation. I notice it in my lower back and, and so on. So, so typically, uh, a lot of pork, my wife will, cook a lot of chicken for the kids. You know, we've got uh, 
four-year-old and a six-year-old, they enjoy chicken. So typically what will happen is they'll, my wife will cook a roast chicken and uh, I'll enjoy the chicken livers. I like, I like livers. I grew up on liver and bacon, calf livers and so on. So I have no issue with that at all. I, I've tried everything in the animal. You know, I'm, I'm quite adventurous with that nose to tail. I, I, I'll do whatever I, I'll eat whatever I can. I think it's important. I don't do it because I have have to or need to. I don't think oh, I've got to, I must get my, my calf livers in this week because I haven't eaten it. If it's, if it's available, if it's, if the butcher's has got it, I'll have it. I've eaten brains of, you know, whatever, whatever comes, but I'm not, for the most part, I'm a steak and eggs type guy or pork and eggs. And I quite happily eat that twice a day. But as I mentioned, if I'm, if I'm at home and I've worked out early, I usually work out around six o'clock. So it's not an, a really intensive, heavy workout, but sometimes I'm at home and I have a coffee and it gets to about nine o'clock and I think I'll have, I'll have three scrambled eggs or four scrambled eggs and then I'll have lunch and I'll have dinner. So sometimes I eat three times a day, sometimes twice a day. Um, and sometimes it's just, it's just easier to make a, a, a big chicken, chicken salad, which I know is for the carnivore community isn't necessarily carnivore, but it, it's keto and it, I, you know, every now and then it, it's fine for me. And as I said, you know, carnivore is a, I just see it as a very powerful tool. And I know that even if I say to myself, you know, I'm just going to eat meat for the next seven days and nothing else. I just, it's just like a nice reset. And, and then I, I might sort of move towards a, a bit of ketogenic, um, but I don't go any, anywhere towards paleo anymore. I don't, I very, I don't eat a lot of carbohydrate at all. Um, when I'm playing ice hockey in the morning, when the rinks are open, uh, I might have a couple of dates uh, but next time it opens up, I'm going to take your tip. You mentioned just having a bit of salt in water, some pink Himalayan, Himalayan salt. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try that rather than having some carbohydrate and see how that plays out. But it's, I, I enjoy it. You know, I, I enjoy the lifestyle. I don't have an issue with it. Um, and sometimes it's hard for me to empathize with some of my clients when I, when they want to go this in this route, but they find it really difficult um, because I just didn't, I just enjoy it. I don't have too much of a problem with it. Yeah. It sounds that's like kind of how it looks. Sounds like an excellent and, and sustainable approach for you. And, um, you know, it's working well for, for your condition, your lifestyle and making oh, you yeah. feel and perform the way you want to. So that's, that's really what it's all about. It's not about adhering yeah. to a very strict set of rules or template or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think anybody with gout or inflammation should consider, I don't, I always say to people, you know, when they want to do intermittent fasting, so I'm, you know, 16, eight, but as a minimum, I would always eat within a, an 11 hour window. And I think anybody that's suffering with inflammation or gout should really focus on eating between eight and seven, you know, just have a cut off at seven o'clock uh, because most people I know that have got gout are usually eating quite late into the evening, you know, before bed. Mm. Uh, that, that I think that, that there's a problem with that. People will have a problem um, with metabolizing their food if you're already susceptible to you know, to inflammation. So as a minimum for me, it's always 11 hours, you know, so, but I'm at my best. I feel great when I'm eating around midday and finishing around six, seven. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. It makes a lot of sense. Um, giving the body a rest from food too. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, Andrew, this has been fantastic. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, I think the listeners will too. And where can folks find out more about you? Uh, Instagram, you know, I'm on Instagram. I, I post daily. I have a daily blog, uh, all about burnout. My, my, my brand is the, I'm the burnout boss. Uh, so I, I focus on helping people overcome or avoid burnout. I think diet plays a key role in that. So Instagram is probably the best place. Um, if you're into business, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, but yeah, Instagram, you'll find me there. My website is andrewsilito.com. So you can you know, easily find me. Awesome. Well, I'll link to that in the show notes and uh, folks can find out more there. Thanks again for your time, Andrew. Uh, really Thank appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. It. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Likewise. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered? 
or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.